Welcome to Pastor's Podcast. Great to have you. We're in a little bit of a dilemma if you are just now joining us for the first time. Season 5, Bane Leapser with Becky Johnson. But we've had a little bit of an argument of whether or not we should do a longer intro or just get straight to the point. It's hard. It's hard to know because we're so amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my, <laughs> my podcast, my, my intros are a little more rambly. Welcome. We're part of the Jesus Culture Podcast Network. Make sure you check out our school. Make sure you check out our conference. And then there's a whole kind of podcast world out there that's like, hello, Pastors Podcast. Let's get straight to our guest. Yeah, it's true. It's You're either one or the other. There's no middle ground, I found. You can't be relational and rambly, like just a little bit. It's either like you're all the way or you're just straight to the point. So there's a whole segment of podcasters who have no heart and a whole segment of podcasters who have a heart. Is you're that what you're trying to say? You're just going to get through our intro on your commute. Some <laughs> podcast hosts are trying to get you all the content by the time you get to work. You're going to, you'll listen to the interview on your way back, okay. on your way home. This is the truth though. This is really true. I like probably have less value for just giving you information and more value of saying, hey, we're all one big family around the world, even though, you know, like, even though obviously like people are, but like, we're all like kind of in this together. You know Let's get to know each other a little bit. You know what you are? You know, your personality type. I just realized you're the person who thinks everyone wants to be your friend. <laughs> your friend. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Why? Of course. Listen, that's right. So when you meet Banning, this is what's special about him. If you meet him, it's like he just assumes you want to be my friend. Yes. Because I'm awesome. Who wouldn't want to be my friend? Where I think normal people go, you know, I got to probably win you over. Wow. And maybe, so I don't know. Well, if Is Becky was gift? to do an Is intro, she's like, hello, Becky, we've got a bunch of stuff we got to do. Let's get straight to it. <laughs> Here is our conversation on worship. Yep. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. Listen, Becky, I, I'm actually uh, a little bit, um, we're going to be talking today with one of my favorites, mm -hmm. who's who's what I call her the John the Baptist of the worship world. Ooh, Read that, it. that's the best time. Rita Springer. Rita, Rita Springer. Springer, she's going to be joining us in just she's a minute. a legend. But uh, Becky, you have many many opinions on this topic of worship because just not only because you're helping lead a church and a movement mm -hmm. that's involved in that but because your husband is a worship leader. Absolutely. I actually am a non leading worship leader. That's what I've decided. I'm a worship leader. I can't lead I can't lead worship myself. But I can control the people who are leading <laughs> but worship. I, I absolutely You're the have puppet master. So many opinions about it. 100%. <laughs> You're a very, and I, I am too, so this is not a negative, but you are a very opinionated, critical thinker. Thank you. So for the, yeah, tell you. So for those that are listening right now, your personality may be like this. I describe it that when I walk into a room, there's a hundred things going on, 98 are right, two are wrong. And I want to kind of talk about the two because yeah. the 98 are what's are stopping us from getting where we're going. I the two think... are, you know, and so now, now that sucks the environment. That sucks the life out of the environment. If you lead with that, it sucks the life out of the environment for creative. So I've had to manage that, but, but you're very similar. I tell people all the time, this is a true story, Becky. I was, I took the entire summer off mm -hmm. and, uh, but I would come to church mm -hmm. And uh, when I was in when I was in town, I'd come and sit in a service with my Bible, second row, take notes. And all my pastor friends were like, "Wait, you kind of took a sabbatical break, but you still went to church?" Yeah. I'm like, "Yeah. Why would I take a Why would I take a sabbatical from church? You know?" And and they're like, "Well, isn't it hard to?" I said, "Oh no, no. I can totally turn off the critical thing when I show up to church." And they're like, "Wow, I just can't." I said, "Well, part of the reason I can turn the critical off." It's because I have somebody on staff who's 10 times more critical than I am. So therefore, <laughs> therefore, if I see something that I think should be fixed, Becky's already seen it and seen five other things she thinks should <laughs> be fixed. That is a bold statement because so, you're a very critical well, person. Uh, well, let, let's take a poll right now amongst us. There's staff in our office right what now. What happens? Go ahead, everybody okay. in this room. Raise your okay. hand if you think Becky's more critical than me. There we go. We're taking a poll. <laughs> So, but, but, this, and this is not a, this is not a negative, but it really was. I said, oh, I could totally go because anything I think that needs to get fixed in the service, Becky's already thinking about it. So let me ask this. How have you had to manage that both in ministry, not just in your opinions about worship, but in just ministry? How Absolutely. do you manage for all of the critical, because this is for pastors, church leaders, anybody doing that? It is interesting. It's a tension that you do. I like what you said. You have to manage it. 
it's not that I have to get rid of it, but I have to manage it because your criticality makes you great. It's actually what challenges the environment and pushes it forward. But what I is that what you tell yourself? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) But what is there a verse for that? Or yeah, yeah, it's in John. How you coming coming up with that conclusion? (laughs) But what I have found is unmanaged, unchecked criticality leads to cynicism, and a cynical leader is a sad leader. And so that's what I have found when. And I know, I know, I'm not managing my criticality when I'm cynical. So I come in. Or you can't enjoy mm-hmm. what's well, going 100%. on, but keep going Yeah, cynical. you can't enjoy it when you're cynical. So I'm coming in and I'm resentful. Why didn't so-and-so do this? <laughs> what's wrong with? And when I start to hear, this is a stolen- Our team, they're starting to, the people are starting to cry in the room <laughs> this right is now. A, this is a stolen tool, but very helpful for, for people who are very critical, is when I am in, internally saying the word should- you know what we should do? You know what they should do? You know what this should be like? Then it's a warning sign for me to go, hold on. Am I being critical? You know, what's my level of criticism? Is it helping? Because when you get into that should, yeah, it's just, it's exhausting. And then you'll yeah. tire people out. So. Yeah, for me, I just find it. I just, I lose the ability to enjoy the mm-hmm. moment and to enjoy what God is doing. Because although there may be some things that needs to get fixed, there is so many things that are going well, so many things that God's doing, so many things our team's doing good and everything else. Absolutely. And we just get so stuck in But you in know, you got to check that too. You don't want to be too <laughs> yeah, optimistic. Yeah, come on. I mean, yeah. I mean, being positive about what's happening, is that really going to move an you're environment gonna, forward? Well, you're going to give people, a, you know, you're telling them 50% is <laughs> so, okay. So. You know, when I read the plans for the tabernacle and I read Leviticus, God was very critical. <laughs> he he My- definitely had an idea of what he wanted, that's for sure. He did not accept second best, that is for sure. So really, we're just being Christ-like, yeah, Edward. Absolutely. That's how it Godly. works, yes. All right, I'm so sorry for anybody listening to this right now. That See, this is the rambly intro that people are already... This, here's my... Can I just say real quick before we get to our guest? There's something called fast forward button. In fact, now you can just skip 30 seconds. Yeah. So I listen, if you don't like my rambly introductions, this skip, 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 skip until you get to whatever you want to get to. It's the beauty of technology these <laughs> oh. days. That's my opinion. Plus, everybody likes me, so why wouldn't they want to sit and listen to me <laughs> ramble? <laughs> See, there you have it, folks. There, there you have it, folks. Well, I am excited uh, when we sat down and just talked about the guests that we wanted to have well, for season five of the Pastors Podcast, a part of the G's Culture Podcast Network, by the way, Becky. Mm-hmm. A, 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 a podcast for pastors by pastors. For the uh, Jesus Culture Podcast For the Network. Jesus Culture Podcast. Uh, I really said, hey, I want to have Reed on. One of the reasons was, was because she actually did a talk for a uh, songwriting kind of retreat that we put on. We had her just zoom in and she did this talk. It was so profound. It was so challenging. And I thought, oh man, I think just pastors and leaders need to also hear the conversations they have. And so we are excited uh, to officially welcome Rita Springer for the first time on the Pastors Podcast. Rita, let me ask some questions about worship. I, I think um, you you are the matriarch, prophet, with a, with just a, a heart for people, a heart for the church, a heart for worship. I think as a pastor, we've been around the worship world for a long time. I guess we started doing it in 2005, I guess, and Jesus Culture was able to go you know, all over the world and, and, and be a part of that type of stuff and play a, a, a part in, in the worship world. But um, I think as pastors especially, I don't know if there's a pastor I'm talking to, if there's a leader that I'm talking to that isn't a little bit concerned about where worship is. And it's interesting because worship's never been more popular. (laughs) Like the intriguing part for me is worship's never been more popular. There's never been, like the amount of songs, I mean, it used to be that you would kind of get a new song every once in a while when that vineyard, I I used to belong to the monthly vineyard, you know, heart of worship thing, you know, so they would kind of come and you'd be stoked to get that little album and and then maybe there's a song or two on there that you're going to sing, you know, and, but now, I mean, there's new songs every week. Every day. Every day, there's like a new song, worships at the top of the charts for so many things, it's billboards. It's all this type it's of stuff. It's never been a career option. Yeah, it, people are making a livelihood on it. It's, it's all a very new. Option. Yeah, it's all very new. And um, and and I got to tell you this: I am not a, a 
like I actually am very encouraged by what God's doing, and I believe deeply in the church. And I'm not a guy that's just wanting to come rail against everything. But I, there is this really weird thing where it's like, hey, I think worship's like at the top of the game, and and it's really popular, and and so many new songs are coming, and it's a, little, a lot of the songs are moving my heart. And yet there seems to be this underlying kind of like concern. Whether I don't know if it's just that it's so popular, there's so much money, it's these guys are so young. I don't know fully. But I guess what I I know that the church, the actual local church, I don't care if you're 50 people, if you're 5,000 people, if you're 50,000 people, the local church is where this stuff is, is really discipled, played out, manifested. So here's my really big general question, Rita. As you look at the worship right now, what is it that you feel the Lord speaking to the church, to pastors, to leaders, to just believers in regards to worship right now? I mean, I don't know that I have a sentence that he's saying or because I felt um, I felt the quietness of God for quite a while mm -hmm. in this subject. Um, last year, I think I saw more and had more conversations that were devastating than I had ever had in my entire career with fallen artists. And, and the amount of sin, I think, was staggering for me. Even for me, I, I've seen a lot. But I, um, I don't think I was prepared for the amount of sin I was listening to and excuse around it. And, and then you ricochet that to pastors that um, don't really want to call their worship leaders out because the worship leaders bring in people on Sunday morning yes. because they're, you know, like movie stars or like, you know, superstars. And so they're not going to hold accountability on to their worship pastors because they don't want to hurt the numbers in their congregation. And I mean, just it goes on and on and on and on. And, and I, I started to have a, just this year has been a very interesting year for me. Very, very interesting year where God just wasn't responding the way I normally have, you know, no problem hearing him respond. He just seemed really quiet. There were things in my own life that, that it just was like, if I had to pray over certain issues that would be resolved in a few days or a couple of weeks, there's just unresolved stuff all over the place. And so I finally was like, and I felt like the Lord had said to me in January, I, I want you to do a new record. And I'm 56. And so I'm like, dude, we ain't going to do a new record. Like we're not doing this. <laughs> and obviously with battles, I felt the same thing. And then I did light after battles and light was buried in COVID. And for me as a worship leader in this, in the industry part of it and in the church part of it, I've wanted everything to be relevant in a season of relevance and, and to do something that God is saying, you know, over the church when I'm doing a record or doing something. I felt like battles was very timely. I felt like light when the Lord said, you know, follow up that album of fight with the record of light. I had no idea COVID was coming. So it was very prophetic for me in what I was trying to, to, to pour out to the church saying, look to the light, look to the light, look to the light, you know. And yet, because I'm in the industry, you have to you have to um, dance the jig, and you have to like do the thing that that it becomes not about with Spotify and all these things. Which I understand it, I get it, I know that it's the dance, I know that it's the jig, but for some reason, sometimes that takes precedence from the core of what you're doing this for and what God is saying of the church. And so when he said to do another record, I just said, find somebody who wants to do it. Because look at this. Would you want me to put out something? We're drowning in worship music on a day-to-day -day basis. You're listening to a song for five minutes and then you're off to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Nothing's really soaking into, in, into people's souls because there's so many songs coming out that those days of like taking a song and having it just resonate in the bones of our being it's like, I mean, those days are kind of over. And so I'm like, I don't know what you want. And so I just said no for six months. And finally, I felt the pressure of the Lord being like, you are going to be, be walking in disobedience if you don't do this. And I'm like, I don't want to disobey you. I'm just heart sick at, at the church. I'm just heart sick at worship. I'm heart sick at where the level of this has gotten. 
And I don't want to contribute to this. I don't want to contribute to where it's gotten. And I said, so if you want me to go write for a new record, then you need to give me the title of this record and you need to tell me what we're writing for. And very, very sweetly, calmly, he said, here's the title to your record. And he said, Fed by Ravens. And when he said it, you know, I was obviously brought back to Elijah. Mm -hmm. And I was brought back to the story of Elijah, you know, I think when he comes on the scene, that's the first time he's in the script and he's, he's, he's asked to do this very heavy thing and prophesy a drought famine. And then God says, run for the desert. And then in the desert, he's fed by ravens. And it just sounds so like, so beautiful and prophetic. But the reality <laughs> of it is it's roadkill. Totally. It's roadkill. I mean, it's not a really beautiful bird that flies over a French bakery and grabs a baguette out of the oven or out of a basket <laughs> on a table. This is hardcore. This is hardcore Christianity. This is hardcore faith and obedience. And I'm like, is this the season of the church? And he said, I need you to write a record to get the church out of a season where they have no idea how to fight for provision when there's no provision or to see me good when I'm not responding, or to believe that I will, even when I send them into desert, to desert, to desert, to desert. And he said, if you want to find the true worshipers, you have to find the ones that are still living in the desert and being fed by the birds. And so I, it's just kind of set me on this pace where I'm like, that's how I'm praying for the church, because what we're finding and what we're writing, and I've, you know, the Lord's been very specific about who to write with and i'm like i don't i'm not with a label i'm not trying to i'm not trying to do this i'm not i'm not we're not even doing this being funded like we're doing this in a completely different manner in the way the lord's telling us to do it and i'm like i'm fully aware that i'm 56 <laughs> i'm fully aware that i'm not but the interesting thing is you know we, we wrote a song at a camp a couple of weeks ago, the guy that's producing, and there's just these precious, like these pure hearted worship people. And we just found this song. And I just was like, look, this is guttural. This is what I want to say. This isn't about writing about God not coming. It's that God is good even when he doesn't show up. Because I think what we want to say is, no, God will come. It'll great. He'll heal. He'll do all these things. Well, I'm going to raise my hand to say, I know the God that lets you keep your disease and still requires your worship. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, nobody's talking a lot of times about that God and that God's all over scripture. Like that God's embedded in scripture. Yes, there's the miracles. Yes, there's all these things, but there's also the miracle of gaining a faith that burns in your bones, mm -hmm. that will believe regardless of ever seeing. That's what faith is all about. And I think that's what I've, I've hit this wall with last year, just being like, oh my God, what is this becoming? It's okay to be fully on stage, your life a wreck, your marriage a wreck, you're living in absolute sin, your pastor's not going to hold you accountable, and not everybody, but, but there's a lot of it going on. Your record label's certainly not going to hold you accountable. And it's okay, because God's just pure love and great, and he's just okay with your lifestyle. He's just great with that. And I'm flipping it to be like, yeah, no, if you really want to find the Lord, prophesy yeah. a famine, and then be led to the desert, only for the Lord to dry up the brook because of the famine you prophesied, the drought you prophesied, and then you have to go and take the 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 last remaining ingredients from a widow who's dying and then her son dies and then you got to heal her son i mean it's like when you look at elijah's life you're like whoa like that's true christianity that's true faith that's true living and where are we doing that in the church i don't see that happening in the church and so you know i i we wrote this song and it, i just was like we may get kicked out like with defender i was like <laughs> We may get kicked out of the church for this, and I'm loving every bit of it. Uh, and it was just, you know, there was a line in that song that said, I'd rather be honest than lie to your face. And the uh, and the 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 chorus is just, I'm 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 
I'm standing in the desert shaking my fist. Is God so good? Yeah, I think he is. Mm. And it's just the resolve of this is what I, you know, this is what I'm going to say. And it doesn't mean that, I mean, the whole song is about God being so good. He's being so faithful. But I'm going to tell you what my flesh is and the, the perspective of it. And I left the right, had to take my son to college. And they played the song the next day, which they never do because they don't, it wasn't played live. But the, the, the other writers in the room were like, there is no way that we're going to sing this song because the way you sang it in that little kitchen destroyed, like, like, cause it's just a, it's just like a raging song. And I, my, my phone just sort of blown up the next afternoon with some of these insane producers and writers that were in that room at that massive camp. And these record labels started that were there just started saying, and they, they basically were like, what is happening? What are you doing? What is this? Huh. And I, I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, we've been waiting for people to say this. Mm. So it, it's almost like this weird thing that we, as the writers were talking about being like, did we just struck a nerve? Did we just hit a nerve? And I think it's when you decide to stand up and say, this isn't working anymore. And I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to get a royalty check, yep. but if I don't say this, I'm going to die. Mm. And if I don't obey the Lord, I'm going to be not in good grace with him. So I'm going to do this. And if it's the last thing I ever say at 56 years old, if it's the last, these are the last songs I ever, you know, release, then I want to do it as loud and as clear as I can to say, I'm not going down without a fight. Mm. I'm not going to be so discouraged by what I'm seeing that I can't believe that a generation will raise itself up that will want to live holy yes. and that will yeah. want to start writing songs that actually change the world. Yeah. And I just think that's still a possibility. And so, you know, I, I was told a story once that I've never forgotten. There's an old prophet. Her name is Fuchsia Pickett. She's since passed away. Oh believe, yeah. But, um, Glory books. She was just, yeah, she was just a, a force to be reckoned with. And and somebody told me the story of her coming into a college chapel. I think it was at Southeastern University. And, you know, the chapel was was a buzz on a Wednesday morning and everybody was talking and thousands of kids were in there. And all of a sudden, this little old woman shuffles across the stage and she stands at the podium and the room comes into a complete absolute hush. And the only thing she says from the mic she says, who will keep watch with me in the midnight hour? And she just let that hang in the atmosphere. And, she, and you know, I was told that there was this silence that came over the group of college students. And, and within a matter of minutes, you know, you know, a hand went up and said, I will. And then another hand, I will. And there is a remnant out there. Yes. Who will stand for the right, righteous and the right things. Yes. And all of this other stuff that we're seeing and, all the stuff that churches are allowing, that's all going to fade away. Because what we do know is that he wins in the end. He wins in the end. And he'll get what he wants to get. And if people aren't willing to give him what he's asking for, he will find the people that will give him mm. what it is he deserves. And I can't worry so much about what the bride looks like right now, I have to remember what the Lord and what God's always had in his heart for the bride. And that's that there's a possibility that she could get herself clean. Mm -hmm. And I'm just still, I'm still yes. believing that she can scrub herself off and clean herself. Up. It's so beautiful what you're saying and just what you're, what you're, you know, I think that the, th the thing is, the truth is we're all sensing that we're all seeing this. I want to ask you just as a, my husband's our worship pastor, Derek. He's written with you before, and we've just been so impacted by your gift. And um, so we're walking with these young people. I was a youth pastor for eight years. We're in, in a lot of lives of young artists, young musicians. And um, it's just so pervasive in the culture of that's what doesn't matter if they're from a church of five or 50 or 500, they all, they want, they want the same thing. They want the the chart topping song. They want the the following. They want to be itinerant. Like my husband, he's out there. He's like, guys, the Lord told him, he said, if you want to serve me, get off the road, quit being a worship artist and turn musicians into priests. 
and just gave him this whole word about restoring the priesthood and where are the Levites kind of thing. But it's a little, you know, I could just be honest and I'm sure pastors listening feel this. It's a little discouraging because the tone of culture, even in the church, is so, we need the next album. We need the next big song. We need the next the next great worship leader who's going to bust things open. And you can kind of feel crazy in the midst of that going, that's not what you want. <laughs> that's not it. That's not the thing to pursue because what we hear young people saying is, well, God's blessing it. Well, look what God's doing. Look at their life, you know? And what could we say to young people as leaders walking with them? Are we perpetuating this problem? Are we adding to it as leaders? You know, do you just tear down the entire industry and refuse to partake in it? It's there, you know, it's it's out there. And worship, and then there is the beautiful part where worship albums are touching the church and new songs are being given. And it's this weird tension, you know, of like sometimes we feel like we just want to, walk away from it completely, refuse to play. <laughs> I think the I think the contradiction too is that the difference between blessing and mercy are two different things. Mm. If, if we can say, I've heard that all the time, well, God, must, it must be okay with God because he's blessing it. Mm. I remember a conversation I had with the Lord where I was like, well, you must be okay with this because they're high on the charts. They're high on the charts. And he just simply said to me, hey, how come you give me um, credit for the charts? And I was like, huh? And he was like, yeah, you give me credit for the charts. I didn't make up the charts. Man made up the charts. Why do you give me credit for the charts? I don't have a chart system. I don't have an award system. I have a reward system, but I don't have an award system. He said, you're asking me like I'm the one who actually put them on the top of the charts. I didn't put them on the top of the charts. A man has the ability to create a, a system that puts people on the top of the charts. He's like, stop giving me credit for things I don't want to take credit in. So that was the first conversation. I was like, oh my gosh, I have this all wrong. And I'm like, there's a difference between blessing and mercy. Because if something looks blessed, it could be the fact that God just has mercy with it. You know, there, there was a story I heard from a pastor that was telling about a friend of his who was an evangelist, very well-known evangelist that was having an affair on the road. And he would take his secretary on the road with him, you know, um, and he was having an affair with his secretary. And it seemed like when he took her on the road and they were having an affair while he was doing the evangelism, more people were coming to the Lord on those nights that he was in the greatest sin. And, and, and so there's this confusion of, well, gosh, God must be okay with it. No, I just think the Lord is merciful. And when you look to scripture and you're like, Jonah gets on a boat and he's got all of these worldly people on the boat with him who understand that there's chaos happening that's beyond their control. And when he dimes himself out as a narcissist, he can't even throw himself overboard because a narcissist needs an excuse to continue to be a narcissist. So he says, I'm the problem, throw me overboard. And so he he gets thrown overboard and they all get saved because the mercy of God is not going to allow Jonah's sin to allow them to not have an experience with God. So if there's if there's a whole band on stage and they've, they've filled a stadium and you've paid $500 to $1,200 a ticket, for a worship event, and they're active homosexuals or um, drug addicts or adulterers or whatever on stage, and they go back to that. But people have been touched by God. That's not the blessing of the Lord. That's the mercy of God. And as someone who knows what they're doing from the stage and knows what their life is like behind closed doors, mm -hmm. it's a matter of time before mercy runs out. And so I think that that's what we've gotten confused. And that's what a younger generation who doesn't understand the, the difference between mercy and blessing. I mean, I remember when the Lord said, hey, I wasn't on Prozac when I created the universe. And I was like, what does that mean? And he's like, it means I didn't need help to be creative. He's like, there's this whole um, lie that's in this thing where my mercy in someone's torment, we'll let them be an artist and paint a piece of art that's now worth a hundred million dollars in a gallery and it's a thousand years old. He said, that's mercy that I got them through that. But 
he's like, I, as the, as the main artist, I wasn't like sad. And then I painted the universe. I wasn't like bummed out. And then I got artistic. He's like, I was creative and I wanted to do something and I did it. If my people who are called by my name would just realize they don't need a crutch. They just need me. Mm. And they just need to call on my name and ask me to come. I will actually clear their minds up. They won't need to be anxiety driven. They won't need to be on Prozac. They won't need to be. And think about the art that we'll create or the songs that we'll create. So we, we've got this artistic, even artists who are creating out of anxiety and, mm -hmm. you know, they're writing out of anxiety. But then we have a generation of people in that because my generation didn't do a really good job, I guess, of tutoring them in. This isn't what it's about. This is not what worship is about. We wrote songs in the vineyard because people's tumors were falling off their bodies. Yep. That's my, that's my um, younger years. Like, I couldn't wait to write a song to see if God was going to heal somebody when the song was sung. Or if I sang the song, would somebody get healed? That's a very different day than we're in now. But in my day, I remember sitting down with, with a record label here that's no longer in, in Nashville. And I remember they were wanting to sign me. I was very young, late twenties had, I think come out with my second record. We were looking for a major distributor. And the guy that I was talking to was head of one of the biggest labels here at the time. And he said, yeah, like, you know, we're trying to figure out really what worship is right now. It's like a big kind of thing. That's kind of coming up. A lot of people love it. I mean, but we're still, it's like last week we had Keith Green's, all of his CDs in the middle of the table. And we were trying to define what was it about Keith Green's music that had so much attention that people loved it so much. And I, I looked at this guy and I was like, you still haven't figured that out. <laughs> and he's, you know what I'm saying? It's like, and I realized, oh, these are logical people that are business minded. Yes that are trying to fit something that's selling into a box yeah. that they could put on a shelf and commercialize it. Yeah. And so what's happened is now we have a whole generation that's raised up with only seeing the box in the shelf yeah. and they don't know about writing songs that, that where tumors fall off. Yeah. Yeah. So you almost can't blame, you know, yes. that's wow. why with my kid, you know, my son's 18 years old and he's, you know, he's a just a brilliant um, producer and beat maker and all this kind of stuff. But You'll know about her son if you follow her on Instagram. Proud mama. <laughs> yeah. Oh, proud mama. Absolutely. Yeah. But he's like, I mean, I've just said to him, look, the number one thing that, that is our goal in this house is there are no ceilings in this house. So we don't live in boxes and your dreaming comes from the Lord and he will never cease to give you dreams. So you can dream like an artist outside the box, but you will one day have to actually be the master of your compromise. And you're going to have to learn the difference between compromise and integrity. Mm. And that's his, that's his road. That'll be his road. Like off in college, that's, that's his road. But I don't think as parents, we we've, we've done a really good job with this generation of stewarding and reminding them of what, what it used to be and not what it is now, because all they're doing is just doing yeah. what, what they see. I think that that's the big one. I think that when we look at, as pastors, especially church leaders, adults, when we look at the landscape, we have to go, uh, I'm the one that set this table. Like I'm the one that's discipling people into and I think, and we don't have time to get into this, but so many of the leaders are dealing with insecurity and they're looking for security from crowds coming or from recognition. So therefore, I'm unwilling to challenge this because it's going to deal with my security then and all that type of stuff. But this is why I think for me, honestly, I, I remember, you know, so I was at Bethel for 18 years, a little bit longer, but with Bill for 18 years at Bethel. And I remember I, I went to one year of college and then I came and got hired and I loved college. And I remember asking the Lord, I'm like, God, why, why, didn't I, why didn't you let me finish college? And he said, you needed Bill more than you needed college. And part of, for me, was that thing that's on his life. And it's a cute little bumper sticker, but he really means it when he says, he says, I wanna be known in heaven. I wanna be known in hell. 
I could care less if I'm known on the earth. And that, like living that way, even what she's describing of the charts and things like that, like like really raising up a generation that goes, I could care less if I'm known in the earth. If that's what happens, you know, that's up to him, but I could care less if I'm known on the earth. I want to be known in heaven. I want to be known in hell. And how do we actually then say we have to disciple a generation into mm -hmm. this is all that matters. Yeah. And what she's describing, by the way, you can't say in my day if you're still recording albums. <laughs> so, so, so I'm going to tell you right now, in my day, if you're still recording albums, which you still are, it's still your, it's day. your day. It's still your day. It's a long day. It's still your day. Um, but that type of thing, and so much of this stuff in what you're describing that 30 years ago, it was just all coming out of the local church. Mm -hmm. It was literally just a whole bunch of people in the local church writing songs at some level, not for the, just writing songs for their church, writing songs for what she's describing. Like, hey, we're encountering this stuff. Let's write songs around it. Nobody was trying to craft songs. Even Martin you Smith. couldn't go viral. Like, no, that wasn't there, a thing. I was talking to Martin Smith because I was saying, Martin, how do we get this songwriting back in the bag around the, it's impossible to not write a song right now without thinking, this could actually set me up. I could, you, you know, it's just, it's there. And Martin was telling me, he said, Oh, like, so all those cutting edge albums he was doing. So did you feel, you know, Obsession, the um, I Can Sing Your Love Forever. Those were literally just songs. He said, those were just songs that we had a youth event every month. And he's like, we'd get together and go, we should write a song for that youth event. Like just a local youth event. He's like, we should probably write a song for that. And then the next month they're like, hey, let's, let's write another song for that event. Like some of my all-time favorite worship songs <laughs> were a handful of these young adults just going like, we should write for that youth thing coming up. Wow. Let's write for that. Like nothing in their head. Mm -hmm. It was nowhere in their head that somehow this would mm -hmm. be sung around the world, that this could make them money. They were literally just writing for that youth group. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I long, I don't know how to get there, Rita, to be honest with you. I don't know how to get songwriters back there, but somehow that thing that just says. Yeah. And the ability to explore too. Like you're not, you're just like, I don't know, I'm just writing this song. Like I don't, I don't. I remember when more people started looking at us when we were releasing albums and it wasn't even songs for us. We were releasing albums. Like it wasn't even like, Nobody's even paying attention to us. Right. So just release the album. All of a sudden now, they know an album's coming out. They've got an opinion on it. There's articles being written, and there's this pressure right. all of a sudden, too. We're like, oh, man. Like, er Anyways, I don't even I, – I don't know. I want to somehow get back to that thing where you're like, I'm just writing songs. I don't know. I'm just writing for our local youth group, and, mm -hmm. and I don't even know who's going to listen to it. But Social media doesn't help. Nope, not at all. I don't know how we'll ever get back there. I think – there has to be a move of God that, I mean, I, that's why I'm so grateful for the, the, the likes of the sin, you know, that are t the movements that are trying to move young people to have encounter, yes. to one encounter, to yes. go after Jesus. You know, Jesus culture played such a big part and um, still plays a huge part in these young college kids and high schoolers that I think just need encounter. Like we, we need encounter. Yeah. And, and, Encounters what changed me. Yes. Encounters what set me up. We yeah. were having encounters with the Lord. So I pray that there would be true encounter. Yeah. You know. It's one of the things I love about Lindy. Cool. Lindy Kofer. Yeah. She it's that yeah. it's that YWAM thing that they have where these guys are like, I'm like, if you go to YWAM and give yourself to missions, nothing in you is trying to be famous. Uh -uh. <laughs> like you were literally signing up for a life of being unknown somewhere in like some country, you know, <laughs> like, and that, that type of raw thing, that, I just am so stirred by. Even the leadership principle of what you reward gets repeated. Yeah. What you celebrate. What you is what, celebrate. And so it's like, we have to, I love what you guys were both saying as leaders, as mothers and fathers, you know, we were talking about Katya Adams at our pastor's conference said this profound statement that I've been sitting on as I lead younger people we platform gifts over fruit. Yeah. And I thought that's what that's what we do. Like you said, Rita, we want the gift, but we're not looking at the fruit of their life. And then yeah. you said, test well, not just fruit. Well, but we platform gifts and not tested fruit. Mm -hmm. I've been really, like even what she's describing about all the people that we platform, you know, we've been looking at the passages around elders. And yeah. one of the qualifications for elders is, have they been tested? Yeah. 
There's a whole nother thing right there. Like, has your life actually been tested, gone through fire, come out the other side with fruit? It has? Fantastic. Let's let's let's, let's get you out there. Exactly. Yeah. But we do that at oh, so young. So What's young. crazy to me is we platform young people in the secular world and it ruins their life. Right? I mean, more more often than not, it ruins their life. Why do we think in the church yeah. that we can do that with 19, 20, 22 year olds? Because we like crowds. You know, I think we have to get really honest about that as leaders. Yeah, I agree. Rita, yeah. I sure appreciate you taking t- some time and just uh, sitting down with us. I mean, we've been talking, we could talk for a can while. Can I ask her one, our one closing question? One cl- yes, absolutely. You've got pa- pastors listening who have worship pastors on staff. You have been a worship pastor. Is that what you were on staff is seven years doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What What would you tell you just have a captive audience of le- of pastors who, who have a worship pastor on staff, whether bivocational or what? We are the gatekeepers. Yeah. <laughs> for the next generation of worship leaders coming. Right. So what would your, if you could have yeah, that? Yeah. I think I always try to encourage, you know, lead pastors to create partnerships with their staff, like partnerships with those people that are, you know, I'm, I've, I've heard some pastors see worship as uh, the the time to set them up, you know, <laughs> the setting up the speaker time. I've heard pastors say that. It's the appetizer. But I think, you know, the worship leaders that are hurting are worship leaders that have a partnership with their pastors wow. and who are just kind of doing it or just doing it as a job. But when you really have true partnership with your team yeah, that's a and, great word. and you know God's called you to lead that church, give you the vision for the church, and you know that the guy or the gal that you have leading um, your people in worship is somebody that you know God's chosen, um, partner with them, share the heart of your messages with them. Like worship leaders should do the same. Like want to know what's your next series. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to know what you're calling our congregation to six months before you're calling them to it so that I can prepare our sets and prepare songs and prepare moments of just letting the Lord use us as a team to actually write a song perhaps, or have a moment. Or I mean, I don't really see people function like that in church anymore. I don't see worship leaders asking God for the songs for Sunday morning. (laughs) So, and I always say, gosh, if Jesus isn't a part of your um, set list, then, you know, good luck to you on Sunday mornings. But I, I just think the worst form of communication I've ever seen is on a church staff. Woo. And I don't know why. Sometimes I'm just like, I mean, I know why, but I just, it's like, it's the place where communication be, should be the clearest, where there should be um, humility. There should be like uh, the ability to come and say, hey, I didn't understand this. Can you explain it to me? Um, at, where it's easily explained. And I think that that if if pastors would really partner with who they're actually hot, who they they've they've surrounded themselves with to lead that church you know i just don't see jesus not doing it in true partnership yeah you know he, he raised up the disciples even though they had issues with each other they had to learn how to do it together jew and gentile they had to learn to do it together which says to us we've got to learn to do this together if we're going to try to get this ship you know to the next location or to the next journey that we're on. So I think for me, that's the biggest thing I I saw because sometimes a worship department feels alone. Yeah. A worship pastor feels alone and separate from the pastor and that his function or her function is only just to fill this role in and, and get the team this and do this and do this and that's it. And they're not seen as any other thing because they're artists and they're moody and they're whatever and you can't (laughs) trust them. Rita, we sure appreciate you taking time, and I have great, great hope for the church. What what you said, I have great hope that it's going to be a spotless bride, and that God is so gracious with us. Um, but I, I really do appreciate. I don't just say this. I appreciate the voice that you are, and the message that you're carrying, the heart that you do it with. Many people, the Phil Manginellis of the world, that just adore you, and different ones. That I, I just am so grateful for you and and what you're bringing. So thank you. And, uh, you're welcome, yeah. you guys. And I'm glad Thanks that, for asking me. I'm glad that your day is still going. I'm excited to hear the next album. <laughs> and Rita, you do, and do you still do intensives with young people, with artists? or? I don't do the dive school anymore. Now I'm just doing one-on-ones, mentorship. And we'll maybe 
bring it back someday. But how do people right now, how do people connect with you or find you online? They just go to yeah, they just go to readaspringer.com or they just DM me. Readaspringer.com. All right. Appreciate you coming on. We'll do it again. It's amazing how quick an hour goes and um yeah, I just love what's on her heart. I love what she carries. I can't think of many more things as important as that. Yeah, what she's talking about for sure. To be talking sure. about right now if you're in a, if you're leading in the church. I think it's really really culturally relevant and really important. She's courageous. Yeah. You don't have a hard time partnering with a worship pastor cuz you go home with him every night. <laughs> well, that's another challenge. That's a we'll have another podcast on that one right there. Well, now I don't know, is outro meant to be rambly or do we just get straight to it? We're just done. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good to see you. <laughs> People are turned it off. They, if they've made it this far, they're they're massive <laughs> they're part done. of it. I do want to tell you for all the pastors, church leaders, just leaders in general, we do have a couple of resources for you. Uh, not just the pastor podcast. We have something called G's Culture School of Leadership, completely online. It is built around developing you spiritually, relationally, and in the skill set of leadership. Uh, Danny Silk, myself, Deborah and Daniel Giles, ton of amazing people jump in. It's really one of the best things we do. GeezCultureSchool.com as well. Pastors Conference yep. every January here in Folsom, the Sacramento area. If it's, you're an executive pastor who needs to just some empathy, uh, working or a senior with a associate pastor leader, um, I'll be there and we can have a breakout session. If you have a problem with criticality, come talk to Becky. <laughs> It's going to be how it works. You're a woman. There's, there's a whole bunch of things. Oh, so. let's go. All right, guys. Yeah.